<laughs> All right, welcome back everybody. So I'll do a quick refresher on what we were talking about uh, when we quit last time. And then I'll ask you if you have some questions coming up from uh, last time and then we'll proceed with, uh, with uh, today's lecture. So we were in the middle of uh, formulating a basis of uh, scalar, vector, and tensor spherical harmonics to do our perturbation theory around Schwarzschild. Of course, we're relying on the spherical symmetry of the Schwarzschild solution to introduce a basis of expansion like this. So we've talked about how to distinguish uh, vectors and scalars and tensors as viewed on the sphere. So anything that carries an angular label is going to be considered to be either a vector or a tensor on the sphere. Anything that doesn't carry such a label is going to be considered to be a scalar. So if I'm talking about a vector, I consider the radial component of the vector uh, to be a scalar on the sphere, and anything that has a vector label uh, in the angular direction is, uh, is a vector. If I want to expand a scalar in spherical harmonics, I just do the usual thing. If I want to expand a vector in spherical harmonics, I need a basis of spherical harmonics. And we saw that we can construct this either by taking the gradient of our scalar harmonics or doing a cross product where, uh, in this notation, we involve the little chivita tensor on the sphere. That's inherited from the cross product structure that we talked about coming from the three dimensional view. Uh, of these things. Uh, when I do this, I'm starting to distinguish between what is a true vector and what is a pseudo vector, or here I call it an axial vector, and that's a structure that I will also propagate when uh, we do this for tensors. So that's the expansion of a vector. If we then generalize this to a tensor, uh, we saw that when we're dealing with a tensor on the sphere, we can always, uh, and I'm talking about symmetric tensors, we can always decompose those in terms of a trace and a trace-free part. The trace part is another scalar, so we can do the usual thing with that. The trace-free part, we require a tensorial basis of spherical harmonics to do that. And we achieve this by basically starting again with the scalar harmonics. And instead of using one derivative to generate a vector basis, we take two derivatives to generate a tensor basis. And because I'm talking about tensors on the sphere, it, uh, those derivatives will be covariant derivatives on the sphere. So that uh, covariant derivative operator here that I introduce is the one that's compatible with the metric on the unit two sphere, and that's what I know omega by this. So I've uh, explained this last time, and I told you that this was a trace-free uh, tensor harmonic that behaves as a true tensor. And then we also have the uh, pseudo-tensor version of this, where we start with the pseudo-vector harmonic and generate a tensor basis by taking an extra derivative. So that's the strategy. If I were using, uh, if I were you know trying to do this for tensors of uh, larger ranks or rank four tensor or something like this, I would continue to use this idea of generating a complete basis by continuing this uh, strategy of differentiation. But here I'm happy to stop at two indices because I'll be dealing with expansions of the metric, two indices, expansions of the uh, Einstein tensor, two indices. So in practice, uh, you know, for our purposes here, we can stop at uh, tensors of two uh, of rank two. So that's the idea that we can take any tensor in, uh, in this case, in three-dimensional space take uh, you know, the radial components expanded in scalar harmonics, the mixed radial and angular components expand them as vectors on the sphere, and then the symmetric uh, tensor on the sphere we can expand as a scalar in terms of the trace, and as tensors or pseudo-tensors in terms of the symmetric trace-free part. And if we can do it in 3D space, that's the last slide that I had last time, we can do it in uh, space-time just as easily. Uh, so now, instead of just distinguishing between the radial components and the angular components, I will be distinguishing the time and radial components versus the angular components. Things that don't carry an angular index are you know, considered to be scalars on the sphere. If you have one angular index, it's a vector, and if you have two angular indices, it's a tensor. Uh, 
and we justify the same strategy. And what I've done here is to uh, give you know a complete expansion of the metric perturbation in terms of spherical harmonics. So if I'm looking at those guys here that include the time and radial components, I'm introducing an expansion in terms of scalar harmonics with coefficients that will depend on T and R, but nothing else, of course, the angular dependence is here. So uh, the, um, uh, the HABLM quantities are the expansions of these components of the metric perturbation in spherical harmonics. If I'm, uh, you know, dealing with the, uh, you know, TR and angular components of the metric perturbation, I'm expanding this as a vector and a pseudo vector, and I'm also introducing here the appropriate expansion coefficients that become functions of T and R, the angular dependence being contained in the spherical harmonics. When I do it for a tensors, well, I have the trace part of the tensor that's uh, decomposed in terms of a, uh, a scalar harmonic, that's the corresponding term here, and I have two trace-free pieces, one of, you know, uh, that, you know, that behaves as a true tensor, that's the coefficient in front, and one that behaves as a pseudo-tensor with this coefficient in front. And now, uh, you know, what happens is that the notation becomes, uh, you know, difficult to memorize because there's many components, many expansion coefficients, and there's really no good way to deal with this. You have to cope with that, and uh, and that's part of you know life when you do perturbation theory. You have to carry around all this baggage when you do calculations. So uh, you know the notation gets involved and heavy and unpleasant, but there's just no way around that. I mean, you could maybe think of condensing the notation, but I'm not sure that would help. Or uh, you could think of even expanding more the notation. Uh, I don't think that would help, but anyway, that's, that's the compromise that seems to work uh, best. Uh, for some historical reasons, this notation basically goes back to the foundational paper on the subject from Reggie and Wheeler back in the 50s. Uh, for some reason, they decided to insert a factor of R squared here, but not here. Don't ask me why, I don't know. If I were to redo all of this, which I did at some point, I didn't want to deviate strongly from their notation. So I decided to stick with the R squared here and not here. If I were to do it now, I think I would basically just not be afraid of changing the notation. And I would insert an R squared here to be consistent. And I would probably insert a factor of R here to also be consistent. Anyway, there's some arbitrariness in the notation, but those are just historical choices that were made along the way. So let's uh, recap on what we're trying to do. We're trying to do perturbation theory in Schwarzschild. And I've talked about all the conceptual aspects of this last time, and I've talked about the strategy of just inserting a metric perturbation into the Einstein tensor and turning the crank to get uh, linearized field equations about the Schwarzschild solution. So the idea would be insert all of this into the Einstein tensor, turn the crank, and get you know, a very nice listing of field equations involving all of those components here. The reason why we expanded spherical harmonics is to take advantage of the spherical symmetry. And the hope, and what will be achieved with this, is that we can decouple all the LN modes and treat them all separately. So the interest in doing the spherical harmonic decomposition is that we can end up with field equations involving each LN mode separately. We can handle each one separately and then reconstruct the metric perturbation by summing over all the modes. If we didn't have a spherically symmetric background, we could still do a functional expansion of this sort, but now we would find that all the atom modes couple to one another. And you know that doesn't mean that it's hopeless to deal with a situation like this. It just means that uh, it gets much harder. When you have spherical symmetry, you can rely on that to uh, expect that all the atom modes will decouple, and now it becomes a whole stack of separate problems you can deal with each one you know, individually and then sum over all of that. So in what we're going to be doing this afternoon in the workshop, it's going to be about looking at a very specific mode, uh, the L equals 2, to describe a quadrupole deformation of the Schwarzschild solution. I'll give you more details a little bit later this morning. I'll introduce a workshop so that you can uh, get to work at it uh, this afternoon. So now it's time to ask about questions uh, you know, that needs to be clarified before I move on, and you have one here. 
does this separability apply to all orders, or is this purely the first order? It, uh, it's, it's a first order property. If you were to proceed to higher order, uh, what would happen is that you would have spherical harmonics multiplying spherical harmonics. And if you remember your Klebs Gordon coefficients, that means that they can be re expressed in terms of spherical harmonics, and now it gets messy. Okay. So at second order, uh, you do have mode coupling, and uh, it means that you know, uh, the situation complicates. Uh, what uh, is still true at second order is that the differential operator acting on your second order perturbation is still the same one as in the first order problem. So you still get some simplicity coming out of this, but now you have additional terms that come in as sources uh, that involve this coupling between spherical harmonic and spherical harmonics. And that means that now you have a lot uh, more work ahead of you when you do second order. So we won't touch second order here. Uh, and uh, you, know, you have to be somewhat brave to tackle that. Any other questions before we move on? All clear? Yes, please. Uh, just the historical note you made about the R squared appearing um, from the computer or something. Um, I don't know, maybe you will get to this at some point, but is that something just is manifest as a difference in the master functions that you end up with? But otherwise, it's not such a big deal. It's not a big deal because, I mean, whether you exclude it or absorb it, uh, it doesn't change things very much. I think one thing that it, uh, you know, so the dimensionality of these guys compared to these guys is not the same because those are angular components, those are T and R components. So the, uh, the unit of the metric perturbation changes depending on the identity of the coordinates. So with the factor of R squared here, you basically ensure that K and G have the same dimensionality as those guys. So that's why I would probably prefer to have an R squared here to make sure that all my metric variables are of the same dimensionality. And when you, you know, solve equations, it's always good to check dimensionality to make sure that you haven't made a mistake. And that, you know, that would be a little bit of help. Other than that, and that's why I would put the factor of R here to, to make all of this homogeneous. Uh, but other than that, it's really not a big deal. It's, it's just you know, choices, that, choices of notation that have not much consequence, really. Yeah? Sorry, does the tensor and vector spherical harmonics, do they and Laplace like equation? Right, so I, I didn't want to go into those details, but the specific choices that I made, I tried to motivate them through that, you know, construction with a, a vectorial basis and all of this. But yeah, the key requirement is that you want those spherical harmonics to have a, a good relationship with the Laplacian operator. And the point is that all of them if you apply the appropriate tensorial version of the Laplace operator on the sphere, will satisfy an eigenvalue equation. And that is what you need to simplify the form of the field equations, because when you plug that, all of that into the Einstein tensor, you'll take a bunch of T derivatives, a bunch of R derivatives, and you'll take a bunch of angular derivatives. And those will organize themselves a very nice way. They will be acting on all of those things. And, uh, and then you will use the uh, eigenvalue equations for all of those things to simplify the equations. I'm not going to be asking that you reproduce all of those calculations, but you know, fortunately for you, some people have done that in the past. And, uh, and yeah, the tensorial harmonics are very good because they allow you to you know, deal with all the angular stuff in a very nice uh, transparent way. And the eigenvalue is a total angular momentum instead of just L? Uh, so, the, so the eigenvalue will depend on uh, whether you're dealing with a scalar or vector or a tensor harmonics. So here it would be just the usual L, L plus 1. If you're dealing with the vectors and the tensors, it might shift to L minus 1 times L plus 2. I forget exactly what it is, but uh, it's something like that. Right? Anything else? Okay, let's move on. So, again, the, 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 the end goal here is that we want to do perturbation theory. We want to insert this into the Einstein tensor, and then we want to equate the at least linearized portion of the Einstein tensor to our perturbing source, which here is imagined to be a point mass uh, or a small particle going around in orbit around a Schwarzschild black hole. So the hard part, uh, oh, okay, I, I just wanted to uh, insert some, t uh, some terminology before we move on, because if you read any literature on uh, black hole perturbation theory, you will encounter those terms. I just wanted to clarify that before I move on. Uh, 
So uh, I was talking about uh, scalars, and then I had the vectors and the pseudo vector or the axial vector, and then I had the true tensor, and then I had the pseudo tensor or the axial tensor. So those are all terms that are used, but what's more common I think, in the literature is to talk about even parity things and odd parity things. And uh, you know, we can think of this in terms of parity transformations and think about how certain harmonics transform under parity transformation. I mean, I could go into all of this, but it's sort of not that interesting. Uh, so what I'll say is that you know, I've introduced the scalar harmonics that behave uh, as a scalar, I've introduced those sort of harmonics that behave uh, as a true vector, and I've introduced these guys here that behave as a true tensor as opposed to a pseudo vector or a pseudo tensor. So all of those things here uh, are named even parity uh, circle harmonics. And even parity just means that they transform uh, as you would expect a vector to transform or a tensor to transform under parity transformation. And all the associated metric variables that come with those circle harmonics are called the basically the even parity metric variables or you make up the even parity sector of the, uh, of the metric perturbation. All the stuff that behaves either as a you know, pseudo vector or a pseudo tensor or what I called before an axial vector or an axial uh, tensor, anything that's constructed from a cross product will have the opposite transformation under parity transformation and uh, those are said to have odd parity. So, and the metric variables that come with that uh, are also said to be uh, of odd parity, and they make up the odd parity sector of the transformation. So, in the literature, you'll see that distinction between even parity or odd parity, or sometimes if you read Chandra Sekhar, for example, uh, and his followers, you'll see the distinction between what is called polar perturbations and axial perturbations. So, those are polar, those are axial, it's all terminology. The reason why this is a useful thing to know about is because uh, you know, the spherical symmetry of the background already allows us to decouple each LM mode from any other LM mode, so that's the power of the spherical harmonics. But we also have, as a result, a complete decoupling between all the perturbations that are of you know, even parity and all the perturbations that are of odd parity. So the equations never mix uh, even parity stuff with odd parity stuff, they always stay separate and that's useful because you have a lot of decoupling that occurs as soon as you introduce this, uh, this spherical harmonic decomposition. So that's just, you know, just making contact with terminology that is very common in this, uh, in this language. Oh, I guess I'm not quite ready to tackle the field equations uh, just yet. So we've talked about uh, gauge transformations. Uh, so I introduced the pedestrian view first last time. I introduced the, the fancy geometrical view last time using the, uh, you know, the stack manifolds and the identification maps and all of this. And what we discovered is that two perturbations can be equivalent if they correspond to different identification maps. And that means that they will differ by a term involving the lead derivative of the you know, thing that you're perturbing. So two metric perturbations will differ from one another if they're equivalent to one another, if they can be related like this to uh, the lead derivative of the metric with respect to any vector field C that is tangent, of course, on the base manifold. If you work out the lead, deriv the deriv the lead derivative, you get this, and that's the equation that tells you that two perturbations, P prime and P, are going to be you know, completely equivalent to one another if they're related by a relation like this. And what this means is that uh, you know, we can change the appearance of a perturbation arbitrarily by just adding something like this to an existing perturbation. I can move from an old perturbation to a new perturbation by adding a term like this. So that's the gauge uh, ambiguity or the, 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 uh, the, the gauge transformation property of a metric transformation uh, perturbation. And uh, as I discussed last time, uh, if we want to eliminate the redundancy of the coordinate freedom, we can do that by imposing a coordinate condition. And there's no unique way of doing this. There are lots of ways of doing that. There's an infinity of ways of doing this. And uh, here I'm going to choose one, 
I'm going to choose one that happens to be the most popular choice of gauge in the literature, not unique by any means, but it's probably the most popular. And that's the gauge that was initially in, uh, introduced by the pioneers of this field, Reggie and Weir. So we need to impose four coordinate conditions, which can be thought of as conditions on that gauge vector over here, to eliminate the, uh, the gauge ambiguity or the, you know, the possibility of changing the perturbation by this kind of coordinate transformation. And what Reggie and Wheeler chose to do is to just impose very simple algebraic conditions on the metric perturbation. So what they did was to stare at this you know, very big breakdown of the metric perturbation. And they said, what we're going to do is to declare that this is 0. And we're going to declare that this is 0. These are two quantities. This is a third quantity. Uh, um, uh, sorry, we've got two quantities here, one quantity here, so we have three coordinate conditions. And on top of that, uh, they declare that h2 over here will be zero. And that's the fourth coordinate condition, and you know, by the time you reach four, of course, you're done, because you only have four coordinates uh, in your freedom. So their uh, coordinate condition is simply the statement that this goes away, that this goes away, and that this goes away. And uh, that's a nice thing to do because it really kills, you know, a lot of those metric perturbations. It really simplifies the equations, and it's really a very simple thing that you can do. And you know, it's just as good as any other choice, but it's especially good because it's very simple and convenient, and you can show that it completely eliminates the gauge freedom. So sometimes you can impose gauge condition. An example of this is the divergence-free condition that is always imposed in linearized gravity, that turns out not to completely eliminate the gauge freedom. There's still residual freedom left. This choice over here of Reggie Wheeler gauge completely eliminate, eliminates gauge freedom. And once you've completely gauge fixed your quantities, then uh, there's no more redundancy, there's no more freedom to be used, and it's all unique. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I don't know. So, uh, yeah, so when you declare a gauge condition like this, what you have to do is to make sure that you can find a vector field C that allows you to enforce this. So the point of view is that you start from a perturbation in any gauge, and you say, can I achieve those conditions with a vector field? And you have to prove that you can, and you have to prove in this case that this vector field is uniquely determined. And you'll have to take my word that this can all be done in this case. Sometimes you find that uh, you know you wish to impose a gauge, and you find that there's no vector field that allows you to impose that gauge, so that doesn't work. Or sometimes you find that uh, the gauge field, uh, the gauge vector here, is not uniquely determined. But in this case, it's all you know, it's all unique, and uh, the gauge fixing is complete. So I think I can't resist going into another editorial rant. And I don't want to make too much of this because that would bring a prominence to issues that should really be ignored. But if you read the literature on black hole perturbation theory, you will see a lot of people coming up with gauge invariant variables and gauge invariant formalism, and I'm guilty of that. And, uh, and I want to uh, go back to the statements that I made before uh, about describing all of this in terms of gauge transformations, gauge conditions, uh, in this analogy that we have between electromagnetism and gravity. So I said last time that there's something a bit dangerous about this because even though it's just word association, it comes with some kind of emotional baggage coming from ENM. Uh, a lot of people, so, you know, when you read the literature in black hole perturbation theory or when you write papers and you get referral reports, you'll, all, well, you, you'll often see that statement. Um, Gauge fixing is dangerous because your results will depend on the gauge. Gauge invariant variables are uh, the only meaningful things because gauge invariant variables are observables. No, no, no. <laughs> so, when we talk about gauge invariant, so you can always 
formulate the equations of black hole perturbation theory in terms of combinations of metric perturbations that can be shown to be invariant under a gauge transformation. And those are gauge invariant variables. And there are lots of ways you can do that. When you think of gauge invariant variables and you think in terms of electromagnetism, that makes you feel very confident that you're dealing with meaningful quantities with a direct observational meaning. And in EM, it would be true. You can, ga you, you can deal with the potentials. The potentials, of course, are gauge dependent. But if you consider gauge invariant combinations of potentials, typically these will be components of the field. And the field are observables, and the field, of course, is gauge invariant. But none of that is true in gravity. You can form uh, gauge invariant combinations typically by taking the metric perturbation and derivatives, and you can show that combinations like this are gauge invariant in this sense, but none of that is directly observable because the metric depends on coordinates. Derivatives of the metric are like the Christoffel symbols. They also depend on coordinates. So, you know, because it's gauge invariant doesn't mean that it's observable. If it's an observable, it will be gauge invariant. So it's true in one direction. An observable will be a gauge invariant thing. But a gauge invariant thing doesn't have to be an observable, and typically it will not be. So there's really nothing wrong with gauge fixing, because in GR we always know that it's not good enough to just say what the metric is. You have to come up with a good answer to a well-posed question. What will this observer see if they measure something like the Riemann curvature at a given location? If you pose questions like this, it doesn't matter whether you chose this gauge or this other gauge, or chose to work in gauge invariant variables, you will be asking a well-posed question, and you will be getting a good answer, meaningful answer. And it doesn't matter which gauge you pick, you will get, you know, a good meaningful answer. So it's not true that gauge fixing is dangerous, it's not true that gauge invariance buys you anything. And uh, all of those people in, out there in the literature has, I think, overemphasized the importance of gauge invariance because they rely too much on the analogy with DNM. So that's an interesting thing. If you, you know, dig into the literature, you will encounter that. Um, the other thing that people don't seem to realize is that gauge, in, you know, gauge invariant quantities are basically the same thing as gauge fixed quantities. So there's really no distinction between one and the other thing. So. Round is over. Thank you for indulging. We'll stick to Reggie Wheeler gauge as a perfectly fine gauge. Uh, you know, I've played with other gauges in my uh, in my life doing perturbation theory. I like this one. Uh, sometimes I dislike it. I like other gauges. Sometimes I dislike it. So you know, it's really a matter of purpose and convenience for specific problems. You don't have to make a unique choice throughout your career. But for today, we'll make this choice right here. All right, so I think now I'm ready to tackle the field equations. Right, so uh, the idea is, again, we have this you know, very explicit decomposition of the metric in terms of spherical harmonics. Now we're supposed to plug that into the linearized Einstein tensor perturbing around the Schwarzschild solution. And uh, what we will get as an outcome of this exercise is a decomposition of that linearized Einstein tensor in terms of the same spherical harmonics we introduced before. So I can take the T, T, or TR, or RR component of the Einstein tensor, and after the outcome of the calculation, I will find that it decomposes into scalar harmonics, and I can just read off from the calculation the relevant coefficients here. The mixed you know, TR and angular components of the Einstein tensor will be composed in terms of the same vectorial basis we had before, and the same is true for the purely angular components of the Einstein tensor. It will be composed into a trace scalar piece, you know, and then two trace free parts over here, and again, uh, it will decompose in terms of the same spherical harmonics. So it's a very long calculation. You won't be asked to do that. But you can basically read off, after the calculation is over, all the individual components here of the Einstein tensor broken up into spherical harmonics. And if you refer to the workshop document, the practicum that we'll talk about this afternoon, uh, at the end of it, you see an explicit listing of all of those things. And it's a pretty long listing, so you know, it's still you know, a fairly you know, massive set of equations that you're dealing with. But we do have this complete decomposition 
uh, and decoupling of all the modes, and we still have this decoupling between even parity and our parity. So, you know, as complicated as it looks, you still have achieved maximum simplicity given the circumstances by introducing all of those decompositions. So we are in good shape now because we're dealing with the simplest possible set of equations you can be uh, dealing with with the smallest set of variables you can be dealing with because we've chosen this Reggie Wheeler gauge that eliminates as many metric components as you can. So uh, this afternoon we'll learn how to deal with that in practice and you'll go through some simple uh, manipulations of those equations. Yep. Mm. I just run out of indices. So, <laughs> right, so those are just you know, notation to distinguish what is the trace part and what is the you know, trace free part of the Einstein tensor. I could have called it Q1 or Q2. Sorry? Uh, yeah, well, but those are, so, uh, so the, those are, so those are the extension coefficients of the Einstein tensor. So they will be basically differential operators acting on the metric perturbations. And, uh, well, let me show you what they look like because I think that will make things a bit more concrete. So this is the uh, the workshop document. So I'll talk about it a little bit later uh, in the morning if I have time. But if you look at the appendix, I'm reintroducing here that decomposition of the Einstein tensor that I just flashed uh, before in the slides. But on the next page, you have the you know full explicit listing of all the components of the Einstein tensor uh, written out in Reggie Wheeler gauge. <clears throat> As you can see, we have various derivatives acting on various metric components, and some are you know, radial derivatives, some are time derivatives. All the angular stuff has been dealt with, so that's the beauty of the square column position. And uh, <clears throat> the idea is that if you're, you know, if you want to construct a perturbation, for example, corresponding to an orbiting particle around your Schwarzschild black hole, you have to make sure that all of those equations are satisfied, given that on the right-hand side of the equation, you have a source term coming from the T menu of the particle. And yes, it's a massive set of equations, but it's still a much simpler task than to construct an exact solution. And as I said before, it's been maximally simplified given all the decoupling and given the simplicity of the rigid wheel So, uh, yeah, and because I ran out of indices, I just you know, chose the musical annotation here. Yeah, I play guitar, so it was, it was natural. Any other questions? All right. So this afternoon, you'll be forced to stare at all of this and to, uh, to solve those equations. And it looks daunting, but I promise you, you'll be able to do that. We'll introduce enough simplification for you to be able to handle that. Other questions? Okay, so let me check the time. Okay, so we've gone about uh, an, um, half an hour, 35 minutes, so I'll keep going. Okay, so that's the, so we saw in all, you know, its explicit glory, the composition of the Einstein tensor in sphere of harmonics, and that's the condensed notation for it. And uh, the idea is that now uh, we think about the source term that will live on the right-hand side of the field equations, and we think of solving all of those equations. Well, so now it can get complicated. It can get complicated because you have many equations to solve. Uh, now, not all the equations are independent because there's still the Bianchi identities lurking around in the background. So uh, the Bianchi identities mean that 10 uh, you know, out of the 10 Einstein field equations, only six are independent, so the same is true over here. So even though we have a very long listing of field equations, there's redundancy in all of this, they're not all independent. So that allows for some degree of simplification. Uh, but we can do even better, and now it depends a little bit on what intention you have uh, when you're trying to solve those equations. If your intention is to solve for the metric perturbation everywhere, then there's really no shortcut. You have to solve all of those equations simultaneously. If your intention, and that was the context that we gave ourselves uh, last time, if the intention is to calculate gravitational waves 
emitted by the particle that will be perceived at infinity and measured by LIGO or LISA, uh, then you can actually apply some very interesting shortcuts. You don't have to solve all the equations. You only need the information that corresponds to the two polarizations of the gravitational radiation. So if your intention is that and only that, then you can actually manipulate the equations into a much simpler set. In fact, you need two equations to describe the two polarizations of the gravitational waves, and that's what's contained here in those two master equations that I'm about to uh, describe, and you've heard something about this in Alessandro's lectures. She talked about the Zerilli equation, she talked about the Reggie Wheeler equation, so that's what I'm talking about here. What I'm introducing here is a subset of all the perturbation equations that happens to be sufficient to get the gravitational waves. In fact, you know, if you have a solution to those two master equations, you can, from those solutions, reconstruct a complete metric perturbation. So it's also good if you have a more complete purpose in mind. But right now, I'll just take a point of view that this is what you need to do if your purpose is to calculate gravitational waves at infinity. So, the idea is that you look at this big mess of equations that I wrote down before, those complicated you know, expressions for the Einstein tensor, and you stare at this long enough and you say, oh, if I take this equation, differentiate it, combine it with that equation, add 2, uh, subtract 3, and then multiply by pi, uh, I will get a nice decoupled equation for one quantity. And if you work long enough, you achieve this, and that's what Reggie Wheeler did once upon a time, and that's what they really did, uh, you know, uh, a bit later on. So they managed to manipulate the equations into something much smaller that contains uh, the essential information. So, what I'm saying is that you can define a new variable, I'm calling it a master function, you can do it in the even parity sector, you can do it in the odd parity sector, and once you've defined the variable and you, you know, came up by miracle with the right definition, you will find that that equation satisfies a very simple equation that decouples from anything else. That variable, well, okay, you have a factor of R here, for some reason it's normalized with a factor of L, L plus 1 in the denominator, but that's not a big deal. You get it by combining K with HRR, and a derivative of k. Why that? Don't know. It's just what works. You have to insert this little function k here that happens to be just a combination of L's and you know things that come from the Schwarzschild metric. If you construct this, you can manipulate all the perturbation equations into an equation that looks like this. And an equation that completely couples from all other uh, you know, perturbation equations. So it's a bit of a miracle, given how complicated it all starts, that you can derive something entirely on its own uh, that looks, uh, you know, that looks very simple like this. So what's the structure of that equation? Well, you have a differential operator over here, and if you stare at this, you uh, you realize that it looks precisely like the wave operator acting on the TR submanifold of the Schwarzschild spacetime. You have the two time dependence over here, and I can repackage this into a radial operator, two radial derivatives in a redefined radial coordinate that's often called R star, that's often called a tortoise uh, radius. But that doesn't matter too much. What we have here is a simple looking differential operator. We have a potential function that I can write down, well, it looks, it looks a bit complicated, but I can construct it like this with various L's, factors of M over R to some power, we have that function k that comes in, that function f that comes in. I mean, it's some function of r, and you insert over here, and the statement is that this differential operator acting on the master variable will be equal to a source term that you can form from the energy momentum tensor of your orbiting particle. And that operation over here involves taking t mu mu and you know, applying derivatives and doing all sorts of things on that. Uh, to match what you've done on the left-hand side. At this stage, you've obtained, uh, as I described it, a decoupled equation for one combination of metric variables that decouples from uh, the, uh, the rest of all the equations. And the claim is that if you solve this equation and you look at the solution to that equation at infinity, uh, you will find 
enough information to know about the gravitational waves in infinity. That's the most direct route to get to the gravitational waves emitted by a particle going around in Schwarzschild space-time. Uh, for one polarization, you solve this equation, and then there's a second equation that will represent the odd parity sector that will give you the other polarization. So that's a very economical package. And uh, if you push the, the, the formulas and, uh, you know, beyond this, you can also find a way to reconstruct the entire metric perturbation from the master variables by you know, integration and various uh, elementary operations like this. So it's very, uh, it's very uh, impressive and uh, you know, it's very practical too because that equation is something that we can handle. It's something that resembles things like Schrodinger equation it resembles things that uh, there's a considerable amount of you know, experience solving. And I'll talk about practical strategies to solve that equation in just a few minutes. So that was the master equation in, uh, in mathematical detail. What I've plotted here is, the, um, is this potential over here. So we have this wave oscillator. <laughs> plus the potential acting on the master variable. So I, I've plotted that potential right here. And you know, mathematically, it looks complicated. But it's basically a potential barrier that goes to 0 at infinity and goes to 0 on the horizon. So if you remember your scattering problem in quantum mechanics, uh, it's exactly the same thing. You have a wave coming in and countering the potential barrier. It will be partially reflected partially transmitted. So those are the waves that come in toward the black hole and get partially reflected by the curvature around the black hole and get partially transmitted to be absorbed by the black hole. So if you remember your quantum mechanics and how to solve your scattering problem uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, all of those techniques uh, you know, come to bear here. And uh, we're basically describing uh, the same physics. So uh, there's a lot of information that comes out of just the uh, expression for the potential. It peaks around 3 m, which is uh, you know, where the photon orbit happens to be. So you can do a lot of very nice analytical work by just looking at the properties of the potential around the peak. And uh, you know, there's a ton of literature based on ideas like this. Uh, you can, on the basis of the master equation, you can calculate the quasi-normal modes of oscillation of a black hole. Uh, and for that, all you have to do is to look for solutions that are purely ingoing at the horizon and not going at infinity. That happens to be true for only very specific frequencies, and those happen to be complex frequencies. And if you search for those, you will find the quasi-normal modes of a black hole. I couldn't talk about this in those lectures, but uh, I decided to leave that uh, aside uh, because of time constraints. So the point is that even though you start with a very complicated mess of equations, you can reduce it down to its simplest expression, which is this for the even parity sector and uh, this for the odd parity sector. And those equations resemble other equations that you've dealt with in physics, like uh, you know, the Schrodinger equation with the central potential. So in the odd parity sector, we have a very similar structure, the same wave operator, a potential that is now different, another master variable, and another source term that you construct from the energy momentum tensor of your orbiting particle. The combination of metric variables in this case for the odd parity uh, master function involves a radial derivative of HT, one of the metric components we talked about before, a time derivative of HR, and then this particular combination of HT and R, why this, I don't know, but it works. Uh, the potential in this case uh, is a lot simpler to write down. It's, again, a combination of L's and R and M and R cubed and all this, and that's a metric function that goes to zero at the black hole horizon. If I were to plot the uh, odd parity uh, potential, uh, you would not be able to distinguish it from that. So even though mathematically the expressions for the potentials look very different, when you plot it, uh, they look almost the same. I mean, it's very hard to distinguish the difference on the plot on that scale. You see very tiny, tiny differences. So again, uh, familiarity with this kind of equation. And if you can deal with the even parity equation, you can deal with exactly the same techniques uh, 
with the odd parity equation. And uh, all of this is very handy when you're trying to get to the bottom line of you know, what are the gravitational waves emitted by the system, uh, you know, particle going around black hole. So a lot of the literature on black hole perturbation theory is basically focusing on those two master equations. Uh, because really that contains the, you know, the, the nucleus of all the information about the black hole perturbation. You can start from that and reconstruct everything, or you can just view this as the shortcut uh, that's, you know, that allows you to calculate with minimal, uh, you know, uh, minimal work the gravitational waves emitted by uh, an orbiting particle. Questions at this stage? Yep. Right. And uh, what's the physics that uh, we can describe? Which is, which is oh, it's the same story. So I, I have two gravitational wave polarizations, and uh, and I can consider each of them to be a superposition of an odd parity master function and an even parity master function. Or I could always, or I could think of this being one polarization and the other leading to the second polarization. So it's you know it's really a superposition. Of both, but you know, I think for simplicity, it's good to think of two master functions leading to two gravitational wave polarizations. So, in both cases, the uh, the significance of this master variable evaluated at infinity is that it describes the gravitational waves. And I'll make this more precise in just uh, in just a moment. Right, right. So, two sectors, even parity, odd parity, two gravitational polarizations, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. So the meaning of the master variable is that if you look at it at infinity, it, uh, it becomes identical to the gravitational wave there. All good? OK. So yeah, so here's my, uh, my slide on the connection with gravitational waves. So, uh, so uh, you know, the context, again, for what we're talking about is let's put a particle in orbit around the black hole, and then let's try to calculate the gravitational waves that will be emitted by this particle. Well, now we have the tools to do that. We have the two masters equation, and then we can evaluate the master functions at infinity. And I claim that this is in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the gravitational waves. So I have two polarizations for the gravitational waves, the plus and the cross polarization. And each of them I can write as a linear superposition of the even parity and odd parity master function. So what I have here is the gravitational wave amplitude going as 1 over r as you go away from the source. So we expect that factor of 1 over r. But I can express it in terms of the master function expressed as a function of retarded time. Because that, you know, that conveys the idea that it takes time for the wave to propagate from the source to the observer. The, uh, the wave function here will be a function of retarded time. In flat space, it would be just t minus r. But, you know, we have propagation of gravitational waves in a potential well. It takes more time to escape. We have the Shapiro time delay going on here. So the retarded time variable in short space spacetime is t minus r minus the logarithmic correction that corresponds to the Shapiro time delay, it takes longer for the waves to escape uh, the pole of the black hole. That's, uh, you know, that's basic gravitational physics, that time delay. So we take the master function, we evaluate it as a function of this retarded time variable, and then we evaluate that at infinity, and that gives out you know, one piece of the gravitational wave polarization. There's also a dependence on angles that I can reconstruct in terms of all of those tensorial harmonics. <coughs> and here's the, you know, here's the uh, bottom line on this. You just take your scalar harmonic, calculate various derivatives, and that's what you get. So we have the even parity master function here, and we have the odd parity master function here, also evaluated as a function of retarded time, evaluated at infinity, and multiplying the right combination of spherical harmonics. Uh, for those experts, if you take this minus i back, everything packages in terms of spin wave and spherical harmonics. So that's what those things, uh, you know, combine to be. But that's just a technicality. 
So that works for the plus polarization. It works also for the cross polarization. So bottom line, if I calculate this and I calculate this, I have access to my two gravitation wave polarizations in complete detail. So that uh, is why the master functions are interesting and very efficient if your purpose is to calculate gravitational waves. If your purpose is to calculate the full perturbed metric around uh, a Schwarzschild black hole, then it's debatable whether the master functions really is a source of help or some distraction. You can solve for the metric variables directly going back to the fundamental equations. But if your purpose is really to go after the gravitational waves, well, that's really the way to go. So uh, when I calculated those uh, gravitational waves, well, that's exactly what I did. I was pretending before that I was displaying here the two polarizations, but what I was really doing is display the real part of the, uh, you know, of the even parity master function, that's the red curve, and the imaginary part of the, uh, uh, the same function, that's the blue curve. So that's what I was showing, and uh, that was you know, enough uh, to display what the, the behavior of the gravitational waves would be, because the behavior of the gravitational wave would be a superposition of, uh, of those two things. So that was the, you know, the purpose behind all of this. How do we calculate this? Well, now we know that we can calculate this on the basis of the master, uh, the master variables. And you know, all of that formulated into uh, the two master functions that I've talked about, either this in the odd parity uh, sector or something very similar looking in the uh, even parity sector. So now the task of doing perturbation theory has been boiled down to solving two equations that have the familiar structure that uh, you know, you've known since your days doing the Schrodinger equation. So it's only a matter now of solving those equations. And of course, there's still work to be done to solve those equations. And that's what I'll describe next. You know, how do you go about doing this in practice? How do you solve those equations for something like a particle in orbit around the black hole? So. There are two options that are available to you. You can either insist in solving them analytically, uh, and that typically involves introducing some other approximation that we haven't introduced yet. We've already introduced the approximation that the perturbation around the Schwarzschild uh, spacetime is going to be small. That's essential, but we haven't introduced any other approximation than this. But you, if you're willing to introduce another uh, approximation on top, you have access to analytical techniques to solve those equations. I'll describe that in a minute. The other option is to just look at that equation and say, there's no exact analytical solution. I'm going to give up on that because I do want an exact representation of the master functions. I'll do a numerical integration. And, uh, you know, Doing numerical stuff is not the same thing as doing numerical relativity, because this is a much simpler context to do numerical work. It's very easy compared to solving the entirety of the Einstein field equations on a computer. So, uh, so you know, the, the, the task of doing this numerically is still accessible, I think, to, uh, to most of us, certainly accessible to me, and I'm by no means an expert in doing numerical analysis. So let's just go into a little bit of the method to do a numerical integration of um, the master equation. So let's go back to the master equation. It looks like this. It has the form of a wave operator in a two-dimensional version of the Schwarzschild spacetime. We've eliminated all the angular stuff. So we have time derivatives. We have rate of derivatives. So we're dealing with you know, a PDE in two variables. So, uh, so that's moderately challenging to do numerically. I mean, I think everybody can do uh, ODEs easily using numerical methods. That's easy. Doing PDEs is always a little bit tricky. But here, uh, we can really rely on the fact that we're dealing with a very simple looking differential operator. And I can make it even simpler looking by changing my coordinates. So uh, one very successful numerical method relies on introducing two null coordinates to replace the T and R coordinates. I can choose a null coordinate that's going to be pointing outwards, and I can choose a null coordinate that's going to be pointing uh, inwards. So U is the retarded time coordinate 
that I introduced before, t minus r star, r star standing for all of this here, and u is an all coordinate that is uh, going in that direction, so uh, so incoming light rays that move, that move in the radial direction will be following lines of, you know, where u increases like that. And outgoing light rays that move on radial, uh, on the radial direction, going outward, will move parallel to this uh, v-axis over here. So I have two null coordinates, and I can trade off t and r in favor of u and v. And if I do that, my differential operator simplifies to something really, really nice. It's simply two derivatives, one with respect to u, the other one with respect to and the reason why the differential operator simplifies so much is that I'm relying on the fact that uh, the characteristics of this problem here are the null geodesics of the Schwarzschild spacetime. So by using the characteristics to build the coordinate system from it, I can, uh, I can really simplify to the maximum possible uh, the appearance of the differential operator. And what this means is that now, in this form, even though R has become an implicit function of u and v, in spite of this, this equation becomes uh, easy to integrate. And if I do it numerically, what I will do is to introduce a discretization of my u and v coordinates. I will define a grid in u v space, and what I can do to get finite difference equations to replace the differential equation is to take one of my grid cell over here and integrate the, dif the differential equation in that grid, across that grid. Integrating this is trivial. I just do you know, one integral and then the other integral. And I will get this minus this, this minus that, and then this minus this, this minus that. It will all package itself into this very nice structure over here. And that allows me to determine the value of the field here if I know the values at preceding grid points. And you can stack all of those things together, and you can do an evolution like this, where systematically, starting from initial conditions here, initial condi conditions here, you can systematically calculate all other values at all the, uh, all of the grid points with a nice explicit method like this that tells you what happens at the north side of the, uh, the grid cell as a function of what happened at previous points. So that structure of the wave equation makes numerical integration very easy. You still have to integrate the potential term across a grid cell, and you still have to integrate the source term across a grid cell. So you still have to do some work to make all of this explicit for the computer to handle. Integration of the source term is very easy, because remember, the source is constructed from t mu nu, which is a delta function on the word line. So when you're done constructing this over here, you end up with delta functions and derivatives of delta functions. And those are trivial to integrate because you're dealing with a delta function. So integration is immediate. You can treat this exactly. The only numerical approximation that uh, that occurs here is to deal is when you deal with this integration over here. And here you have to be a little bit careful because you know if the particle is crossing the cell here, your field is not you know differentiable across the grid, so you have to be a little bit careful with this, but if you avoid those cases, uh, you can basically construct a very good approximation of this integration here by just expanding this as a Taylor uh, expansion, for example, about the middle point of the grid cell. So, uh, so basically, that's the hard part to deal with, but you can in introduce you know, uh, an approximation of this uh, that can be very high order, very precise, and you can build a whole numerical scheme based on those very simple ideas. And that was done by various people, and it led to very successful you know, numerical integrations that you can apply to all sorts of problems. And when I you know, calculated this, I did that myself very proudly with a code that Carl Martel, my former student, built for me. So I have no merit. Uh, but he was using those, uh, you know, those, uh, those methods that I just described. That is a time domain calculation of the waveform based on this finite differencing version of the uh, uh, PDE that describes the master, uh, <coughs> the master equation. Um, there's another avenue 
that uh, you can uh, exploit. Here I was, uh, you know, doing all of this in the time domain, and I was, you know, integrating my master uh, equation for uh, a function that depends both on t and r. But, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, we can choose not to proceed this way because we can eliminate the time dependence by doing Fourier transform. And that is what we do in quantum mechanics. When we do a scattering problem in quantum mechanics, we always look at the time independent version of Schrodinger's equation, and we do that by Fourier transforming the wave function into, uh, you know, something that depends only on frequency and uh, the spatial variable. So we can do the same here. We can uh, you know, consider a Fourier transform where we go from a function of t and r to a function of frequency and r. And if we do that, the time dependence goes away. It's replaced by a factor of the frequency squared. And now instead of solving a PDE of t and r, we all have to, you know, all we have to do now is to help to solve a whole stack of ODEs and r only given omega, and we have to do it for all relevant values of frequency omega. So the trade-off is that uh, now you have a much simpler differential equation to solve in one variable, but you have to do it for many different frequencies if you want to rebuild your time signal by calculating the Fourier integral. Lots of efficient ways of doing this. You can do FFTs. You know, it can be done very efficiently. But still, you have to evaluate the, the, the wave function for many different frequencies in order to faithfully represent uh, the, uh, the, the time signal. Uh, in the past, I think it's proven far more efficient computationally to do it in the time domain. You can get your answer a lot quicker than to rebuild that frequency by frequency using the Fourier transform. But, you know, we may choose not to be concerned with numerical efficiency and proceed to do, uh, to do it like this. And in some regime, in some context, it actually becomes far more efficient to do it like this in the frequency domain. So when you're down to a uh, function of frequency and radius, then you have a much simpler looking ordinary differential equation to solve, and there are lots of avenues uh, at your disposal at this stage. You can choose to integrate that equation numerically. That can be done. Now it becomes simple because it's a you know, 1D, uh, you know, an OBE in one uh, single variable. Or you can approach this analytically and try to construct a very good representation of the function. And this set of people here, MST standing for Mano Suzuki and Takasugi, working out of Japan, not experts in general relativity by any means, but uh, you know, experts at solving ODEs came up with a very, very powerful tool to solve those equations analytically. It's amazing what they've achieved here. Uh, it's not easy. I mean, there's a steep learning curve to learn to do calculations their way, but once you master it, uh, you know, it's extremely powerful. And, you know, I think almost everybody who's doing self force these days uses that, that, that formalism. It's really very powerful. So basically, the idea is that you can get a very good, almost exact uh, representation of the solution to your PDE, of your ODE, in two different ways. If you're working close to the horizon, you can represent it as an infinite sum of hypergeometric functions. And that sum converges rapidly to the, uh, to the exact solution. That's what you do near the horizon. If you're working near infinity, you can do that in a different way. You can expand this time in terms of Coulomb wave functions, which are just a solution to uh, Schrodinger's equation for Coulomb potential. So you have two series representation for your solution here and here. They overlap, so you can match one with the other. And now you have a representation of your solution everywhere in terms of an infinite, an infinite series that converges rapidly. It converges the more rapidly, the smaller uh, the product of m times omega is. So if in your problem you only have to deal with small frequencies in the sense that m times omega is small, then uh, you can actually work this all out analytically and get a very good approximation for small frequency of uh, the master function everywhere. If your problem doesn't have a small m omega, you can still do it numerically. 
sum numerically that uh, those two series and get complete representation of the function, uh, and still get a very good near exact uh, representation of your function. Small frequencies, uh, remember at Alessandro's talk, small frequencies relate to small orbital velocities. It translates into weak gravitational field. So if on top of the small mass approximation that is the foundation for perturbation theory in the first place, you want to add the assumption that the particle moves slowly in a weak region of the gravitational field of the black hole, that becomes a very powerful method to solve all the equations. And there's a ton of literature, both prior to these guys and after these guys, to work out gravitational waves coming from particles going around black holes to very high order in an approximation where this is small. Fujita is the king of this kind of calculation. It's insane what he managed to do. When you calculate the gravitational waves in an approximation where m omega is small, you end up generating a series in powers of m omega. The leading term in that series reproduces the quadruple formula that you get by basically just doing Newtonian physics with a little bit of wave theory added to that. What Fujita managed to do is to go to order 44 beyond the Newtonian you know, leading order answer. I don't know how he does it. I mean, so of course he had Mathematica and he was able to you know, automate the process, but it's exhausting just to read the expression because it takes pages to, uh, to read off all those components. He's managed to do that and more. I mean, he, he, he's very impressive. That's just to show that if you want to pursue the analytic route, you can do really, really well if you learn this formalism over here. And I think it's really paid off for a lot of people to do it this way. There were other methods to do this before that were far more clumsy and uh, harder to push to higher orders. But this is very systematic, and it works beautifully, and you can push it to you know, insane, uh, insane depths. Okay, so I think now we're good for, uh, for a break. Uh, anybody has any questions before we do that? Yes, please. Yeah, it wasn't really clear for me how to set up the boundary conditions when you're solving your mass equation, or if it wouldn't be possible to create it as a general problem. Yes, so in the, in the time domain, of course, the key part is to formulate the, what, what's known as characteristic initial data for your evolution. So you have to provide the initial values here and here. And it's always a problem in, and it's also a problem in full numerical relativity, uh, how do you specify the initial solution? Uh, you know, in some sense, you know, to specify the initial solutions, you have to solve the problem from an earlier time, and then from an earlier time, and then from an earlier time, to get what the situation is supposed to be at this time, so that you can evolve toward the future. So there's always a bit of an unknown thing, to because you haven't done the earlier solution, so you have to basically start from, from something which will be arbitrary. Uh, so in numerical relativity, it's, it's a big problem, and people have found ways to deal with that, trying to come up with orbits that have already circularized and are you know, free of junk radiation as far as possible. Uh, in this context, it's very forgiving, because the, you know, the bottom line is that you can start with any junk condition you want. And uh, what you will get at very early times is all you know, a big you know, junk radiation, you're going to get a lot of radiation that just comes out of the system and goes either into the black hole and off to infinity. And that's completely unphysical, that's completely an artifact of your poor choice of initial conditions. But within an orbit, it'll all dissipate. And the evolution from then on, it, you know, doesn't, uh, you know, uh, doesn't depend on what uh, the initial conditions were. So basically what I'm saying is that because you have a source term in your wave equation, uh, the memory about the initial conditions slowly uh, dissipates, and uh, you only you, you basically get a solution that's always only you know sourced by the so only cares about what the source is doing, doesn't care about what the initial conditions are. So in practice, what people do is they say zero zero, and uh, you basically create the particle at the initial time in a massive violation of the constraint equations of general relativity. But you don't care because all the junk that comes out of this very unphysical choice propagates out of your grid, and very soon after that, you get perfectly fine evolution corresponding to what the source has produced in the meantime. Okay, and then 
so sorry you follow your equations, then uh, okay, it's probably is clean now. Um, but when you calculate like this waveform, you go like to out of boundary at, uh, at infinity. Right. So when when do you actually stop this? If you if you're actually evolving your equation, like you just go for all very low. Well, Right, so so of, of course you're limited in, in terms of practicalities uh, with, with the size of the grid. So you have to hope that your grid is far enough, large enough that, okay, you'll never be at infinity, but maybe you're close enough. Uh, so, you know, and basically the criterion is that you have to be at a safe distance away from the particle in the central black hole. That could be 100M, that could be 500M. Uh, you can be very clever and, uh, you know, calculate the waveform at 100M at 200 m, at 400 m, and then look at the scaling of your answer and then extrapolate to infinity. So you can play games like this. But in practice, if you're far enough away, uh, you're close enough to infinity, even though that sounds strange. How can you be close to infinity? Well, three is pretty damn close to infinity when you think about it. A hundred is even better, and that's, that's good enough for practical purposes. And then, of course, if I take a Fourier transform of the waveform, I should get like some of the Poisson Yes. So, uh, so yeah. When you do it with the Fourier transform and you do it analytically, then uh, you're in better shape because you do have access to infinity, because your analytical, you know, uh, representation of the solution allows you to go all the way to infinity. So you can certainly uh, do better. And you're right. So if you had a so if you have a situation where the particle keeps on orbiting the black hole, uh, you will never see quasi-normal modes. But if you arrange for the particle to actually fall in what will happen in the course of the evolution is that uh, the particle will graze or will come close to the peak of the potential that will excite the normal modes of oscillation of the black hole and you will see that quasi-normal mode signature uh, of the ring down as the particle is plunging in. So you have, you know, there are very nice simulations that show all of this. So you, you see a signal that basically is produced by the particle until uh, the black hole itself starts responding dynamically to the presence of the particle, and you see the quasi-normal modes coming out. Yeah, very, very pretty stuff. Yeah. Should have shown graphs of this. I, I, I didn't think of that. Other questions before the break? Okay, so let's uh, reconvene a little bit later, and uh, we'll talk about curve.